Right oh, um, thank you very much for inviting me. And I do hope you're going to enjoy this and, and, and find it interesting. It's called You Too Can Help Swifts. And the reason behind that is that there's an awful lot of birds that you and I can't help. We can't help individually. An awful lot of birds are vanishing, uh, like cuckoos. But there's precious little you can do personally at your home or in your garden to help cuckoos. You, their problems stretch over the whole of Europe and possibly even into Africa, but certainly over the whole of Europe. And we can only act to help birds like cuckoos and other long distance migrants that feed on insects who are particularly badly affected, uh, really by seeking governmental action and really by donating to organizations like the BTO and the RSPB who have an international remit and a political remit too. If you're a big landowner, you can probably do something to help cuckoos, um, spotted flycatchers too maybe, but otherwise it's going to be hard. But with swifts, because swifts nest in our houses, there's an awful lot we can do to help them. And this talk is really about just that. Now, I, I think that swifts are the most spectacular birds that you can have above your house, in your house, around you. They are just phenomenally great at flying. They can do things in the air that other birds cannot do at all. And here are some examples of what swifts do. Now, remember that swifts do not land. They cannot land on the ground. Um, swift legs are very short and very far back. So a swift on the ground can only shuffle. It can't lift itself off the ground like on legs, like so a robin does and hop. It can only shuffle. And so a swift on the ground is a swift in trouble and they would never normally land on the ground unless they were in serious trouble. Now, here is a photograph showing the swift's foot. This is a swift bursting out of a man-made nest box at high speed. And the foot shows four toes facing forwards like, like that. They have no thumb. They've got no opposable digit. They cannot cling. They can't do that. They can only hook themselves onto things. They can hook themselves onto walls, tree trunks, lighthouses, vertical surfaces. If they're rough enough, they can hook themselves onto, but they cannot cling. They cannot hold. So when a swift wants to drink, it has to come down and skim water. And thanks to these amazing modern cameras, these digital cameras, these high speed jobs, we can see now what swifts are doing. Because if you've seen a, a swift drinking, and if you walk around Walthamstow, around the reservoirs, you will see swifts drinking, but it happens so fast, you can't see what's happening. It's like, like that. It's that fast. You, you, the human eye hasn't got the ability to focus on what's going on, but these cameras have. So here is a swift coming in to drink. Look, its lower beak is just about to touch the water. And here's a swift drinking. It's cutting a little groove in the water and getting a few drops in, in a microsecond before pulling up and taking off again. And if the swift makes a mistake and hits the water surface, it's going to get stuck to it. It'll try and row itself out with the big wings. And then probably a pike will come up and grab it. And that's it. There's no margins for failure in a swift's life. There's no safety net. So it's rare. I've never seen it happen myself, despite watching swifts drink thousands of times, but it has been reported. I've seen it happen to a dove and I've seen it happen to a bat. Um, I saw the dove hit the water and its feet were taken off by fish within seconds. So it's, 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 I know because I pulled the dove out, I swam over to it and pulled it out, but it was a goner. So life is tough and swifts are sufficiently agile to, 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 to cope with it. Now, swifts catch all their food in the air. As they don't land, the food has to be airborne. And so they catch basically any flying insect or a drifting spider without a sting. They don't go for insects with stings, they can separate them out. But anything else is fair game, even up to quite big sizes like drone bees and large hoverflies. Now, here is a swift going for a fly. And by some counts, swifts can catch up to 20,000 insects a day. 
how long does it take you to swat a blue bottle in your kitchen? You know, I mean, it usually takes me two or three minutes, I guess, to sort of connect with the blue bottle, because the blue bottle is quite bright. It's taking evasive action. It can see me, and it's trying to get out of my way, and it can see the swift. Some of the insects that swifts catch, like flies and hoverflies, are very, very agile and perfectly bright enough to know something's hunting them. Others, like aphids, aren't. They'll just get scooped up by the swift. But others, like these ones, a nice big food article, get very worried by the presence of a swift and start zooming all over the place. But still, the swift gets them. And that's because it has fantastic agility in the air. And to prove that even further, here are swifts mating in the air. And swifts are about, I think, swift groups about the only group of warm-blooded creatures that mates in the air. I don't think bats do but swifts do, and it's quite easy to see in May. You'll see two swifts screaming around the sky very close together, and suddenly they go like water going down a drain, and at the bottom they just touch, and that's it, they've mated. But think of the accuracy of flight you'd need to do that. It's just amazing. And that is what makes swifts so special. They Stunning agility in the air. They can do things with their amazing wings and their amazing aerodynamics that no other bird can. And you've got to look at them as being an incredibly successful design. Um, Swifts have been around at least 49 million years. That sort of places them in the living fossil category. And here is a fossil swift. It's called the Senckenberg Swift. It was found in the Rhineland in Germany about 20 years ago. It fell into the muddy margins of a hot tropical sea that extended from what is now the Rhineland to what is now Glasgow at a time of very hot climate, very high carbon levels. And this swift was entombed in oil shaley mud and pressed and preserved for posterity. It was then found in a quarry. And if you go to the museum in Glasgow, you will find loads of fossils, not Swiss, but fossils, other fossils from that same sea, from that same period. And there are incredible things like sharks with teeth sticking out the top of their heads like a Mohican, and nobody knows what those teeth were for. And there's other things like this Bazillosaurus. This is the Bazillosaurus, an early whale, so a mammal, and it's got blowholes. And the one thing you can say about those weird sharks and the Bazillosaurus and everything else in the museum in Glasgow is that they're all extinct. They are designs that failed. We didn't kill them off. Time changes. Evolution killed them off. None of them are left, but the Swifties. And that's a design that has lasted perfectly successfully for 49 million years. This swift here is virtually identical in exterior size and shape to the North American chimney swift, a bird that is still just about with us. And swifts have been around as a stunningly successful creature for all that time. We've been around, estimates vary, about 150,000, 300,000 years. Nobody seems to quite have decided how long Homo sapiens has been around, but it's a blink in time compared to the swift. And swifts are long distance migrants. They are such spectacularly good flyers that they can do the most amazing things on migration. They migrate like no other bird does because they don't land. Even birds like the Arctic tern, they can land on water, they can land on land. Even albatrosses can land on the sea. Phalaropes have got a huge migration run. They can land on the sea, but swifts can't land anywhere. They are so superb, superb flyers. They are like sharks in water. Sharks apparently have to keep moving all the time because they haven't got a swim bladder, so they have to get the, they can't float. They have to get the air going through their gills, past their gill membranes to get the oxygen in. So they have to keep, keep, keep swimming. Well, swifts do the same. They keep, keep, keep flying because they can't stop. Now, just to show what the migration is like, this swift was kitted out on the 23rd of July, uh, July with a thing called a data logger, which we get back off the swift a year later when it comes back to its nest and we decipher it with a computer and it tells us where it's been. Now, this swift flew off on the 23rd of July and it got to Madrid on the 26th, three days to get to Madrid. 
spent some time in Madrid, went down to Mali, uh, got there on the 1st of August, and then did a leisurely flight through to the Congo, getting to the Congo on 10 days later, uh, no, seven days later, on the 12th of August. This is pretty fast flying, actually, but there will be food all the way. This is open to Atlantic influence, sea influence. There'd be water, there'd be insects. It spent a huge amount of time in the Congo, and then it heads off on the 9th of December over to Malawi, and then it goes for a little Christmas break to Mozambique until the 24th of January. And then it comes back and it spends another three, four months in the Congo, leaving the Congo on the 6th of April, flying to Cabinda. It leaves Cabinda in Angola on the 14th of April. And then it flies for three or four days over the sea to Liberia. We this was checked again and again because nobody could believe that a Swift could fly for three or four days with no food and no water. It can't drink the sea and there's virtually no insects over the sea. So it is flying on its reserves. How far could you run with no water? Two or three hours before you collapsed? Four or five hours before you collapsed? Three or four days, you'd be dead long before the time was up. Then it feeds up over Liberia for 11 days, still some equatorial forest in Liberia full of insects. And then it flies across the Sahara for another three, four day run until the 1st of May. Again, a run with mostly no food, mostly no water. Swifts have been seen flying through the desert here at 25 feet off the ground in sandstorms. I mean, how do they do it? Nobody knows how this little bird can be so utterly tough as to get through this lot, but it does. Ends up in the Atlas Mountains, starts feeding up, moves across to Morocco, more feeding up over an area which is basically fruit and veg production these days, so plenty of food and water there. And then, this is just amazing, it sets off on the 6th of May, and on the 8th of May, it's back in its nest in Cambridge. Two days to fly across, straight to Gibraltar, Spain, France, the Channel, and East Anglia, East England. Two days, two days to fly that whole distance is desperate to get back. So that's what Swifts can do. That's what those incredible aerodynamically perfect structures can do. They're always flying except when they're nesting. This is the migration run. It's probably a load of tosh to say 14,000 miles because Swifts are like a dog when you take it for a walk. You might walk five miles, let the dog off the leash and it's probably doing 15 or 20. Because remember, Swifts are going all over the place all the time hunting insects. Winter in Africa, sure, mostly in this area. I've been down here and I've seen lots of Swifts down here, but they were probably the ones that came from China, because our Swifts, Swifts live from Ireland right over to Beijing, and the Chinese ones do a much bigger migration run right over several huge deserts, right over Arabia, and right down to roughly this area, slightly different area, they winter in, and as I said, I saw lots over, over Namibia. Every time there's a little tiny bit of drizzle, Swifts suddenly appeared in the sky, up to five, six species, suddenly appeared in the sky, and when the insects were rising off the ground after the rain, the Swifts were at them, and then as soon as it stopped raining, often just after a few minutes, the Swifts just vanished. You never saw them come and you never saw them go, but they followed the rains. Um, they're faithful to their mates and their nests. This is a spectacularly interesting feature of swift life. They choose a mate and they'll stick with them forever, barring accidents and, um, and bust ups. They'll choose a nest and they'll stick with it forever, barring demolition and other problems. Um, we think it's got a good reason because a baby swift, when it comes out of the nest, it has got to be perfect. It's got to have full adult plumage because it's got to jump out of the nest and fly straight off to Africa. It's not like a robin or a blackbird or a wren or a blue tit. It can't jump out of the nest all fluffy, incapable of real flight, and then hop around the garden for a bit before it gets a bit competent and learns to fly. A swift has got to go Bing, fly straight away off to Africa. So it means much longer in the nest to get those adult feathers. It means 42 days average in the nest. So the quicker the swifts can start breeding, 
the better. So if they've got a mate ready waiting for them, if they've got a nest ready waiting for them, they're off to a flying start, you might say. Whereas if they had to waste time finding a new mate, seducing them, building a new nest, they would waste two or three weeks. No, they can't afford that. They've got to hit the time of peak insects. They've got to hit the right period and exploit it. So that's why they come back now, late, than other migrants, and that's why they need longer in the nest. It's those insects, it's the essential food, and the long time their chicks take to get those adult feathers. They're slow breeders. The average is supposed to be one and a half chicks a year. It can be none in a really bad, wet, horrible English summer. And remember what Byron said in Don Juan, the English summer lasts for two weeks in July. And that's the man who moved to Greece um, and Italy. Um, it can be like that. There can be dire summers. And when there's a really bad summer, there'll be no baby swifts. They'll just give up, kick the eggs out of the nest and give up. Or they might try later on. If it's a very bad June, May, early June, they might try later on and stick around till August, even into September but they are slow breeders. They don't churn out chicks like blackbirds or especially blue tits do. It's a slow production and they have a long life. I mean, blue tit, lucky to last a year or two. Same with robins, same with blackbirds probably. Swifts, seven or eight years is about the average. And some of them have got up to the high teens There's even a record of one of 20 or 21 years old, I think. So a long life for a small bird not many things can catch them. That's one of the reasons predation is low on swifts. Yeah, peregrines, hobbies, occasionally kestrels, uh, sparrowhawks will catch them. Some birds will catch them in full flight, like the falcons, and others will ambush them. Ambush them at the nest. And if the nest is in a mm, vulnerable place, then yeah, they can have a little problem, um, which can be um, like... Say the nest is under flattish tiled roof. Well, crows, gulls might hang around on the roof and grab them when they come out of that from under a tile. Um, sparrowhawks might hide in the shrubbery and whip out and grab one when it's coming in and out of the nest. But predation rates are low. So it's not that that is a problem for swifts. Famous for their screaming parties. This is one of the very few social birds we have. We have birds that flock in winter and develop a social pattern in winter, like geese, starlings, um, waders, but who separate into territorially exclusive areas to breed and shove the neighbours out of their area. Um, again, small birds tend to have to have a feeding zone and they keep everybody else away from their nest. Um, Swifts don't. Swifts don't bother too much about nesting colonially. Uh, they don't like other birds getting actually into the nest, but otherwise they tolerate their neighbours very well and they talk to them. They have what are called screaming parties. If you stand outside a building with swift nests in it and swifts are screaming past down the street, you'll hear them replying. That's a ping pong of screaming outside and screaming back from inside. And we don't know what they're saying, but we do know enough to know that it makes it attractive to other swifts. So we can use swift calls recorded at the nest, not in flight, at the nest, to attract other swifts to look for a nesting place. Now, you might think, if they don't get eaten by predators, what knocks off swifts? And the main cause of death is starvation and hypothermia, cold and wet. And this is what happens when the weather goes tragically wrong. Last year, there was one of these incidents here in the Balkans, Thessalonica and um, uh, what's Macedonia, that's the country there. And what happens in these events, and it's typically, usually it happens around here, around here, where there are mountain ranges. And the swifts come up from Africa, across Spain, it's lovely and sunny, they get across the Pyrenees, and the other side of the weather is appalling. It's pouring with rain, it's blowing a gale, and it's miserable, and there's not an insect in the air. The same thing can happen in Switzerland very much, round the Alps. The weather can, one side of a mountain, the weather can be great, the other side it can be dire. Same thing happened in Macedonia last year. And, um, the swifts hit this bad weather, 
the wind is terrible, they can't turn back and they get soaked and there's no food. So they cling to each other, they cling to buildings in these what are called swift huddles. And what happens then is that the ones on the inside might last the night and the ones on the outside will be found dead on the ground in the morning. Sometimes they just fall straight out of the air dead. There was an incident a few years ago in France when dreadful weather, Swifts just started raining dead out of the sky. In Macedonia, it was all the Hirondines and Swifts as well that started raining dead out of the sky. They ran out of food, they ran out of luck, they ran out of time. And that is probably the main cause of Swift death. Swifts bring us real benefits. Um, each swift can eat thousands of mosquitoes and aphids every day. And this is getting more and more important because I mean, put COVID to one side, just for a moment, I know it's utterly appalling, but it just shows what can happen out of the blue. And out of the blue, in the past 20 or so years, three insect-borne diseases have arrived in Europe that weren't there before. They're now all in the Mediterranean, but they're moving. First off was this little mosquito, the tiger mosquito. It's absolutely minute and it comes from Southeast Asia where it breeds in forest canopy flowers that fill up with rainwater. So the mosquito is so small it can breed in just a flower full of water. And of course, once it was introduced accidentally to Europe, it started breeding in litter. Guess what it bred in? Discarded bottle caps from mineral water bottles. It can breed in as much water as that. So any old litter that has got a bit of rainwater in this mosquito will breed it. And it is a voracious little beast. It's causing public health problems in Italy and France. And it um, is active by day and night. It is now reached the south of Paris and it's expected to get to Britain within the next 20 years because it's getting more and more tolerant of the cold. Now, there are three new insect-borne diseases carried by mosquitoes like this and others in the Mediterranean now. Dengue has arrived from the Pacific into Egypt. Um, West Nile virus has arrived by a circuitous roof, route from the USA into Italy. Um, it got, it came from the USA in car tires that were intended for recycling or burning in power stations in Italy. The car tires have been stored in the open, they had rainwater in them and the mosquito larvae were in the rainwater. So with the best intentions, the worst things happen. Um, it's now caused several public health emergencies in Italy, um, but um, it does kill people. It's killed people in the USA, but not in Italy, but it's a nasty disease. And um, as with dengue, West Nile virus is incurable. Uh, the third disease is chikamunga, I know what I think it's called, but chikagunya, something like that, came from the Caribbean, has more or less the same symptoms as rheumatoid arthritis, horrible affliction, and again, incurable, now in the Mediterranean. The result of all this, is that European health authorities are getting more and more worried. And in Italy, the government has been asking people to put up nest boxes for insect eating species, birds and bats in their gardens, on their houses to control these pests because they don't really want to keep spraying everything all the time everywhere because it costs a lot of money, it poisons people's pets and children, it gets local authorities sued. Spraying living areas is not an easy option. Um, Italian co-op has been giving away bat boxes to people um, for the same purpose. Does it work? Yes. My cousin lives in Italy and until very recently she had a huge man-made swift colony in the buildings just across the railway line from her about 100 meters away and she could sleep at night in summer with her windows open and not get troubled by mosquitoes. But a developer redeveloped the building and destroyed the swift colony despite promises that he wouldn't. That summer, my cousin had to buy mosquito nets. So all that makes insect eating birds very, very important for people living in towns. Swifts used to nest in trees. Uh, we used to think they nested in rock faces and cliffs, but in fact, studies show that very few swifts do because they just aren't that right sort of holes. Um, they do, they will if they can, but not that many of them. And we now think from further study that swifts probably nested pretty much exclusively 
in ancient woodpecker holes, in ancient trees, in ancient forests. Well, of course, we haven't got many ancient forests left. Most forests now are commercial. They're tree farms. They're no more wild than a field full of cabbages, really, because they're all planted in rows and they're cropped when they're 30 years old. And trees that with woodpecker holes in are not encouraged because it makes them less valuable for sale as planks. Um, so um, you have to look at the really tiny scattered remnants of ancient forest for this phenomenon. Here is a oak tree in southern Sweden with a very old woodpecker hole. You can see it's partly grown over by the bark here. And there's baby swift looking out. This is the RSPB's reserve in Abernethy. It's the part of the old Caledonian pine forest. And these very exposed climax forest trees have got woodpecker holes in them, great spotted woodpecker holes. And there's about 30 or so pairs of swifts that nest here every year. And the RSPB has put up some fake tree nest boxes for them uh, as well to encourage them. And it's, it's been a big success really, but it's the only known colony in Britain of tree nesting swifts to find a bigger one you have to go to the much threatened, wonderful UNESCO heritage site, the Bialowieża Pop Forest in Poland. And if you haven't been there, go, because it is one of the most glorious places to go in early summer that I've ever been. It is just full of warblers. It is full of lilies. It, I mean, carpeted with lily of the valley, full of, of, of orchids and full of birdsong. You're hit by a barrage of birdsong at dawn. It's just glorious and the Polish government are hell bent on chopping it down. God knows why, but they have been subject to all sorts of legal action to stop them and they're still doing it. So God only knows what the heck on earth is going on in those people's minds because they sold the wood off and didn't even make any money out of it. I mean, it's just utter vandalism in my opinion. Um, but at the last count, there were 600 swifts nesting in ancient woodpecker holes in ancient hornbeam trees in the Bialofiesia forest. And swifts are secret nesters. This is one of the problems because they're safe from predators, but they're highly vulnerable to us, to building, building work, retailing, re-roofing, demolition, often destroys them. Here are some examples. This is outside Lincoln, where a swift is nesting under pantiles. The, it's nesting on the sagging roofing felt under the pantiles. It's wriggling in under the tile. This is in Belgium. God knows what's happened to this brick, um, but um, we never found out. But swifts found it, and they're nesting inside it. And here's a swift coming in to take over from the other on the nest. This is a post-war British house, and you can tell it's post-war because it's got the anti-bird and anti-bat grills that became legally necessary under the building regulations after the war. All new houses had to have these to stop those dreadful things, swifts and bats, from getting inside your loft. Um, and he, this swift has found a way around this stupid law and has climbed up this ornamental tile work and is nesting in the gap between the roof and the top of the ornamental tile work. This is a Swedish swift and it's again going under pan tiles, those handy tiles with those nice lipped bits that you can get underneath on a farm in Sweden. This is a barn and here we have it. There's a beam behind this, 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 this barge board here, and it's just nesting on top of the beam. Very, very restricted place. This is a pub in West Sussex in Horsham, and they took the barge boards off and they found swifts nesting. That's a swift nest nesting on the brick steps. And when they rebuilt it, they put proper nest boxes in to keep the swifts comfy in better, more spacious circumstances. This is a swift nest. It's made from airborne material, anything that blows about on the windy day that seems soft and suitable. I've seen them flying back with feathers and I've got a photograph of one flying back with a polythene bag. And um, this looks like moss and pigeon feathers. Feral pigeon feathers are very popular with swifts because there's so many feral pigeons. At the seaside, they use gull feathers. Uh, an egg and a day old chick. This is all stuck together with saliva. So it gets a rather it looks like wallpaper paste has been used to stick it together when you see one. But swifts are in trouble. And here are the problems. Loft insulation forces out nesting swifts, no space for them. Building regulations showed you what happens. You know, they, you've got to grill any gaps in your roof. Re-roofing and demolition obviously destroy nests, eggs and chicks. People often don't know they're there or, or, or just ignore them. 
modern architecture, new buildings are pretty useless. They've got no gaps, no cracks, they're usually mechanically ventilated. Eco homes, for example, are heated with an electric pump and electric elements pumping heated air through the house and recirculating it. It means that really nothing can get into the house except humans and germs. There's no chance of, um, of, 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 a, of, a, of a bat or a bird getting into the, a, a modern building to, to, to breathe. There just aren't any entrances. And inadequate legal protection. Um, bats' roosts are protected all year round, whether they're in them or not. But swift nests are not protected unless they're in them. If they're in use, they're protected, but in winter, they're not. And yet we know that swifts have to have that nest to come back to, to successfully breed. So well, things like this happened. This was the dem demolition of a warehouse in Antwerp and um, it knocked it down one Sunday morning. And luckily the local equivalent of the BTO observer was cycling past and he stopped it, uh, despite almost having a couple of punch ups with the building workers, he stopped it until the police came and then the developer was fined 80,000 euros, but it didn't replace an entire shattered Swift colony. This is in some ways just as bad. Um, I was in Salamanca on an architectural trip and I was looking at this utterly gorgeous 16th century townhouse, which has been fully restored, absolutely exquisite building. Oh, if only it could be mine. Anyway, um, it can't be. So there we have it. I was looking at it and thinking how lovely it was. And then I saw on the floor, these anti-bird and bat combs, which are sold by all builders merchants. You can find thousands of people selling them on the internet. It's just so depressing. I thought, why, why do they want to fit these? This house has been here 500 years. Birds and bats have never done it any harm. It's beautiful. It's lovely. It's been restored for another 500 years. Why do we worry about it? Why are we so you know, squeaky clean? We can't have a bat in the house. I mean, I'd love to have bats in the loft. I'd love to have um, uh, uh, swifts. Well, we've got swifts in the roof here, actually. And we've just moved to this place. And one of the reasons was because there's swifts in the roof. And the management of this block of flats is swift tolerant. So great. But a lot of places aren't. And you sort of think, why not? Why can't we have beautiful wildlife around us every day? Why can't we share our personal world with beautiful and interesting creatures? Why have we got to drive everything out? Why have we got to live in sterility? What's wrong with us? No, we shouldn't. The main problem, though, is exclusion. Um, we know from this survey done and published in British Birds that 10% of pre 1919 houses can provide nesting space and it comes right down and it's really bad after the Second World War when the building regulations change. And now my guess, nothing. Because you see a house like this, it's got no gaps, it's got no holes, it's got no barge boards to wriggle under, it is sealed all the way around. It's intended to be sealed and insulated to keep the heat in, to save money, to save resources, to save carbon emissions. Sure, fine, but leave a space for wildlife. Same with this sort of office building. I mean, these are hugely popular this sort of building and uh, even worse ones that are all glass are terribly fashionable now but there's virtually there's nowhere for wildlife apart from maybe feral pigeons to nest or rest or do anything on these buildings they are completely unfriendly and then we come to another major problem which is insect declines i mean people who do proper research have discovered that in this short period here Insect populations in Western Germany fell by nearly 80%. That's the actual biomass of insects fell by 80%. That's just an incredible sum. And we don't have to look very far to find out why. This is not something we have to puzzle over or do extra research on. The research has been done by people like Professor, um, oh, good Lord, just forgotten his name. Goulson, Professor Goulson, Dave Goulson at Sussex University. And he gave me this information. I got this from him. Um, Dave Goulson asked farmers in Sussex what they were having their contractors spray on their fields. Now, uh, farmers hire a contractor to do the whole job and the contractor will tell them, oh, next week I'm doing your slugs, next week after that I'm doing your insects, week after that I'm doing the slugs again, things like that. And so they place themselves in a contractor's hands and the contractor comes and does it all. Right, okay. The winner, so to speak, in this competition of who'd had most insecticide to put on their land was one farmer who'd had a single crop, a single crop of oilseed rape sprayed 22 times, 22 
times with, here's the list of what he had sprayed on his crop, insecticide, fungicide, herbicide, uh, what's this one? Herbicide, fungicide, molluscicide, herbicide, fungicide, fungicide, ammonium nitrate, um, fertilizer, fungicide, fertilizer, fertilizer, fungicide, insecticide, fungicide, fungicide, insecticide, um, insect, insecticide, insecticide. Now, after that little lot, nothing is going to be alive in that field because these these things they do what it says on the tin. They kill things. 22 applications would have killed everything in that field except the crop. And so what lives there? What can live there? Well, only things that can eat the crop and things that can eat the things that eat the crop. So in a, the, the ecology in a field like this will be wood pigeons eating the crop, plus buzzards and crows eating creatures that have been poisoned by the sprays, and eating wood pigeons that succumb to overindulgence in the crop probably. So you get a very limited biodiversity. If you want to prove it, go on Eurostar. And as you emerge from Calais, a tunnel, count the species until you get to Paris, because you'll be going over one of the most intensively farmed arable farming areas in the world. And you'll be lucky to see seven or eight species of bird by the time you get to Paris. There'll be wood pigeons, there'll be crows, there'll be rooks, there may be some jackdaws, there'll be buzzards, there'll be couple of species of gulls and you might see some ducks on a few ponds. You might get to eight species by the time you get to Paris. There won't be any small birds. It's just utter desert. It's what George Monbiot, who writes for The Guardian on environmental matters, calls the chemical desert. He's referring to East Anglia, but he refers to any intensively farmed area in, the, in, in Europe now. It is a major, major problem. Swifts are probably less affected than birds, like small birds um, that can't travel far for a meal. Swifts can travel a long way for a meal, so they rely on towns, and we're not spraying towns, so there's lots of areas in towns that are okay, but for other birds it can be curtains. Now swifts are not excluded from this problem, they're just suffering less than many other birds, but uh, more than many too. Here are the figures. Um, it's the latest ones from the British Trust for Ornithology. We've lost 58% of swifts overall. Scotland slightly less, Wales rather more. Average, minus 5% a year. They're amber listed, they'll be red listed next time. They could suffer the fate of the passenger pigeon, a bird which we once had in millions could be out of existence in just a few years if we don't turn things around. Now, urban birds, you why they really do matter. Why does life in towns, why does life around Walthamstow really matter on the macro scale? Well, research by the University of Leeds has shown that urban areas hold more species than the countryside. And our urban areas have become nature reserves, whether we like it or not, willy nilly, without us doing much about it, they become nature reserves. Last redoubts, many vulnerable species. And why is this? It's because they're not treated with chemicals and because the variety of environment is much greater in town than it is now in what's called the countryside. For example, you have allotments, you have playing fields, you have canals. The canal going through Woking is a triple SSSI. It's so rich in wildlife. Um, you have, what else you got? You've got um, brownfield sites, you've got roofs, flat roofs with things growing on them, you've got things growing in gardens, you've got neglected gardens, even better. You've got walls, you've got verges, you've got loads of places where all sorts of creatures that have been designed out of the countryside, can now find a place in town. Uh, my friend Louis Philippe in Belgium, he lives in the centre of a city in Belgium, and he put a six inch deep green roof on top of his block of flats when he got a bequest where his mother died. He got a nice lot of money, and he and his mates bought the freehold of the block of flats, little block of flats, and Louis Philippe put a six inch deep green roof on top of this very strong concrete block of flats. And within six months, he had got two stunningly rare species of solitary bees nesting there. So it can be done. They will find these places. So it's worth doing. And it's, that's the key to a lot. We can keep life especially invertebrates, especially small things and small birds, we can keep it going in towns when we can't keep it going in the countryside. And one day when we see sense, 
and we stop poisoning everything all the time, we stop kill, kill, killing everything out there, then maybe we can re insert from towns into the countryside species that are otherwise extinct. Why help wildlife at all? Why are we doing this? It's not just sentimental slop, you know. It's not just because we're benighted animal lovers and um, uh, uh, polar bear huggers and stuff like that. It's because our civilization depends utterly on the plants, animals and microorganisms of Earth that supply it with essential ecosystem services ranging from pollination, crop protection to supplying food and maintaining a livable, livable climate. That's what Professor Ehrlich, Paul Ehrlich of Stanford says, and he knows his stuff. This is a leaf cutter bee, isn't it gorgeous? No, it uses its bottom to pollinate. Why biodiversity batter, matters to us? Well, there's a fantastic piece of recent research from Londoners. Dr. Vicky Holden, Newcastle University, asked 25,000 Londoners to describe their mental well-being, their life satisfaction, self-worth, happiness, feelings, and she matched it to their postcodes. And she found that if you live a kilometre from a green space, you feel rubbish. And if you live within 300 metres, you feel a hell of a lot better. So get out into the garden, get out in the green space and really exploit it because it does you good. And reduce biocide use. The key to living in a town and getting it humming again, literally humming with insects and grasshoppers and all that, is to stop using biocides. Now, if your local authority, when you appeal to them or put pressure on them or whatever you do, says, oh, no, we've got to pour the glyphosate, we'll just say Paris, Strasbourg and Nancy don't. They stopped. Instead of pouring money into the pockets of chemical companies, they're pouring money into the pockets of the unemployed. They're taking on people to pull the weeds by hand and they're creating local jobs and creating local a bit almost, you know, not prosperity, but a bit more money going in the right direction. They're getting people off the dole, off benefits, by employing them as gardeners in nice jobs in the open air, doing good things. That's better than pouring money into big pharmaceutical chemical companies, isn't it? It's a better way of spending your council tax. Get, get some people out there doing nice jobs and making the place lovely for you. Paris, they're replanting 100,000 of the street trees, and if instead of pouring glyphosate round the bottom, they're saying, apply to the town hall for a little license, we'll give it to you to garden round your street tree. And you can garden whatever you like round your street tree. And it, when I last time I was in Paris, it was looking so much better. And in Nancy, here they are, since 2005, they use no chemical treatments at all in their natural spaces in town, and their parks look Gorgeous, beautiful. And then you get birds like this goldcrest. Goldcrest, our smallest bird, totally insectivorous. If you stop pouring the poisons, you'll get birds like this back, making everything just that bit nicer. Where I used to live, I had the window open and I could hear the gold crests calling all day long in these lovely Leyland conifers outside my window. A tree that everybody seems to hate for some reason, but which I love because they're full of gold crests and cold hits too. Just gorgeous. So be open-minded and start pressing your council to stop pouring the poisons. Increase the habitat wherever you can. I take these photographs wherever I go. Now, this is where I live in West Hampstead. Uh, Camden Council used to pour the glyphosate twice a year around all these trees and they quite often killed them or injured them. They poured so much glyphosate and local residents just around the corner said, oh, no, 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 we'll do it ourselves. And they got Camden to stop pouring the glyphosate and they planted their own plants. And this I have found is done all over Hampstead now from the richest streets with the, you know, the, the Russian oligarchs living in those gigantic houses. They're doing it or their servants are doing it. And around the corner from me, where people of much more modest means are living, they're doing it too. So everybody likes it. And then down here, we have a roof in Lisbon. This is a splendid, very, very sort of, you know, accomplished, expensive, I guess, green roof. But it's on the uh, roof next door to the art gallery. That's on top of the art gallery and I photographed it. And it is one of the sort of number of green islands around Lisbon, which is actually a pretty green town with big parks. And it means that birds and insects can move and feed as they're moving around town. There's little oases for them to stock up on. And remember, Portugal is a mega migration. Lisbon is a mega migration zone. 
So lots of feeding stops for all sorts of things. Butterflies too, they migrate. And bats migrate, all sorts of feeding stops through Lisbon. Now, this is Vienna. And here are the Boris spikes, so to speak. And here is a huge barrier to stop people pushing their bikes onto the tram track and getting squashed um, while chatting to each other, you know, innocent tourists and not knowing what they're doing. These plants are there as a safety barrier, but also they continue from the park as an extension of the green and they feed insects. Um, up here, we have a roof uh, outside our hotel room window in Antwerp. They've planted a sedum flat roof, a, a green roof, where actually it's pink, and they've got their own beehives living off the sedum flowers. And as I looked out the window, I saw this sort of thing all over Antwerp. And here you are in your own Walthamstow. This is Walthamstow village where good, kind people planted this plot with a perennial meadow for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. And when my wife and I walked past, we could hear grasshoppers. And you hardly ever hear any grasshoppers these days, but there were grasshoppers there and there were lots of butterflies it was absolutely lovely. And you've got to support insects and invertebrates. They're vital. They support our entire in existence. They're essential and they're irreplaceable. Even things like this blue bottle. I was researching bits for these talks and I came across this bit about blue bottles. Blue bottles, it turns out, are an essential pollinator for carrot crops. So much so that in Canada, one of the most sprayed countries on earth, I understand, they breed blue bottles for sale to farmers to release, to pollinate the carrots. And I've got a big umbilifer in my garden, an Alexander's, and it's just coming into flower. And guess what's sitting all over? Because it's a carrot family plant. Guess what's sitting all over the flowers, blue bottles. Everybody else swats them and sprays them and kills them. It turns out if you want to eat carrots, you've got to have blue bottles. Helping swifts, back to swifts. Swifts need the insects, that's why I keep harping on. We can't see anything in its, in its isolation. Everything is joined together, but we're helping swifts at the moment. So there's lots of solutions. Cheap and simple nest boxes cost about 15 to 20 pounds. Adapt a bit of your house. Chap called Roland Giddy did this with two bits of wood while his house was being redecorated. He converted these beam ends into separate, four separate nest boxes. This is the Swift brick. There's loads of models now. When I started, there was only one, this one made in Germany. These ones are now made in East Anglia and cost 30 quid each. They're called the S brick, the Swift brick. They can be made to any size and any color of brick to fit whatever bricks you're using. And you use them like this. This is a Dutch social housing end of terrace and they've got all these Swift bricks in there. Perfect place for them. We need 20,000 Swift bricks every year just to keep pace with demolitions loss of swift nests and here are three public libraries that's local authorities that have agreed to have swifts in fact are eager to have swifts they've got their architects to design them into these new buildings this is the antrim public library swifts are already using it this is the hayridge uh, in Carlompton, another public library and social center eight swift bricks and a calling system in there and this is the public library in bournemouth massive great mural and um, six swift bricks tucked in just in the right place. You can do it. It costs next to nothing. Local councils love it because it ticks their boxes for their biodiversity achievements. It's cheap, it's easy, and they don't need any maintenance. New build can be stunningly good for swifts. Here's a chunk of Walthamstone new build. Unfortunately, no swift bricks, but it would have been so easy to get them in. And these buildings with their flat brick clad walls are totally perfect and these s bricks could have been made to match this stuff and popped in all over any of these vertical surfaces would be just great there's a place called the nimbus tower in nijmegen in holland it's got a hundred swift bricks in it and they started getting taken up almost as soon as the multi-story building was put up only a few years ago so yeah this sort of building perfect if you can get the planners get the council get the developers get the council to demand biodiversity things, you know, features. Get the planners to specify swift bricks, perfect, reservoir nearby, and then make sure the job's done. But if you can get into on these projects, you can do wonderful things. And we can show you projects all over Europe. Brilliant, convincing examples for Walthamstow's planners.
Why Walthamstow? Well, it's a great place for swift because of these reservoirs. They're freshwater reservoirs, and so they've got lots of insects that hatch out of the water and supply huge amounts of food at dawn and dusk and even on moonlit nights for patrolling swifts to eat. Perfect. And what a sight. What a sight it'll make for Walthamstow. A unique feature for Walthamstow, which you all know, is the famous Swift chimney. I'm not sure whether they've moved in yet, but they've got Swift calls playing each summer. And I've been giving talks there and keeping an eye on it. And I was involved in the design. I, I worked with the architects uh, and specified what size bricks and had to be and all the rest of it. And then it all went up. And I just hope it's going to be a great, great feature to, you know, a real wonderful centre for Walthamstow. Swift swirling around the tower. It'll be just so lovely. What can you do to help? Well, you can put up an S-Box and okay, they don't cost much. You can get one for like 15, 20 pounds. I know it's very high. So the people who put can put them up for you for reasonable sums tend to be TV aerial companies because they're used to doing a lot of small jobs in any given day and they have uh, the right sort of equipment, drills, ladders, that sort of thing to put up aerials and they might, might as well put up a swift box. So I've been told they're pretty reasonable to so ask them and then encourage your neighbours to do the same and then ask the planners every time you see planning permission you know those pink signs goes up in the building and it says um, planning permission has been sought you write in and say oh the old place had swifts in it the old place had bats in it uh, must have features in the new place or must support biodiversity swifts are a good choice for walthamstow must have swift bricks and um, just keep nagging away write in meet the planners go to meetings ask for sensible low cost easy biodiversity improvements get the word across because it's happening now all over the uk all over europe set up or join a local swift group um I couldn't find one for Walthamstow. There's, there, there, there's, there's, I've got a swift helper in Walthamstow um, who I'm going to introduce to you in a moment. Um, but here is a very jolly swift group I help set up in Campiglia Maritima in Tuscany. I do a lot of swift work in Italy. And um, here they had a meeting in the public square in this hilltop town, which is full of swifts, which were falling prey to renovations because a lot of the old farmers who'd lived in this village retired or died and their children took over their places not for farming but as summer cottages and to rent out for holidays and they were having them all done up and you know new en suites put in and all the rest of it new kitchens and re-roofing and the swifts and the bats were getting the fuzzy end of the lollipop i'm afraid so um a friend of mine eugenia got in touch with me and said how can we stop it and we had a lot a lot of thoughts and planning and she set up a swift group and she was brilliant here she got swift experts from all over northern italy to come and talk to people they had she invented and made swift biscuits she got a local coppersmith to make swift cutters for swift biscuits and now the town sweetie shop sells them to tourists so they've got here are the sweet swifts of campiglia and every tourist goes home with a packet and they're gorgeous and i can send you the recipe i've got the recipe if you want to make them at home they're fantastic italian biscuits are totally different uh, they're really they're really nifty um she 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 helped the swifts and they do swift walks this is a photograph with her mobile phone of local swifts my god isn't it lovely you can see it's hilltop town and the swifts fly all over the neighboring countryside over the marshlands feeding up it's a big marsh uh, 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 a world wildlife fund reserve just just over there it's you know, full of water full of marshy mush and loads of insects and loads of swifts it's just great and you can do the same you can do the same please help swifts these are your local contacts um, apart from the rain group tonight you can also talk to mike prio of hackney swift now he is useful because he is a planning person. He is an expert in building planning. So he knows the laws. So Mike Prio is a stunningly good resource for um, uh, anything to do with planning and local authorities. He'll know a way in. He'll know who to talk to. He'll know the right words to use. And then there's Glyn Williams, who lives in Walthamstow and goes to Bird Fair every year to work on the Swift stand. And she is a fount of wisdom on all things to do with nest boxes and how to get Swifts accommodated. So a couple of people you can talk to there. And then any other advice, come to our website. We've got downloadable free leaflets. We've got 
all sorts of advice. We sell Swift Core CDs for six pounds by post, and we sell Swift Core MP3s, all well proven for two pound by download. So um, get in touch. Hope you've enjoyed this talk. Hope it didn't go on too long. And um, any questions, I'll be delighted to try and answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you.